Jim. I'm one of the pastors here. It's uh, nice to see your beautiful faces here this morning. Um, this is a, an exciting day. As Pastor Tyler said, it's Baptism Sunday. Okay, I can see you're all excited about it. Okay, there you go. There's a few of you. But it also is Thanksgiving week, and it just seems like we were talking about this last week, but it's here again, right? And so in celebration of Thanksgiving, the Lord had put this on my heart. I thought that we could read a psalm together as a family. And so um, we're going to read Psalm 100. It's only five verses. Actually, the title of this psalm is a psalm of Thanksgiving. And we're going to put it up on the screen so you guys can read it. So if you're able to stand, why don't you stand? We're going to read this together out loud. And if you notice, the first line, uh, first line says, make a joyful shout to the Lord. It doesn't say a whisper. It says a shout. So you guys need to read this loud, okay? You ready? Here we go. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Know that the Lord, <laughs> he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. You guys feel free to join me anytime. <laughs> Enter in his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Hallelujah. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving. You may be seated. Well, over the last uh, few months, we've been looking at the seven I am statements of Jesus recorded in John's gospel. And actually, Jesus uses this I am statement some 23 times in John's gospel. But out of those 23, seven times Jesus adds these incredible metaphors which all express his saving relationship toward the world. And so far we looked at two of them. A few months ago, we were, Pastor Wesley brought us, brought us, I am the bread of life, the true bread that comes down from heaven. And then Pastor Russell brought, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And this morning, we're going to be looking at, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door in John's Gospel, chapter 10. Now, just to let you know ahead of time, there are many, many lessons in these 10 verses, and this is just going to be scratching the surface this morning. It's going to be short, but it's going to be sweet. Um, but I want to encourage you throughout your week, uh, please read this. Maybe for Thanksgiving, you can discuss it with your family, uh, with your friends. But there is a lot of lessons here. There's a lot of lessons if you're a pastor, if you're a leader, if you're a servant, uh, if you're a parent. If you have sheep, there's a really good message in here for sheep. But this morning, we're going to look at John chapter 10, and we're going to actually pick it up in John chapter 9, verse 39. And just to uh, kind of fill you in on what's happening so far, if you recall, Jesus has healed this man from blindness in chapter 9. Uh, his friends and neighbors are overwhelmed. They see this, and so they take him to the nearby uh, Pharisee police department. They give him the third degree and basically get nowhere with him, so they call his parents in. Uh, and they plead the fifth, and so they send them out, and so they call this man back in, and he schools them on a thing or two on what Jesus did and what God is doing. And so during, through their frustration, uh, they send him away. They ridiculed him, and actually they excommunicated him. And Jesus, he said he heard about this, and being the true shepherd that he is, he went out and sought this one lost sheep. It says that he goes and he finds him. And in the midst of a crowd of some historians say there could have been at least a quarter of a million to half a million, maybe even more people during this feast at this time in, in Jerusalem. And if you've ever been to Israel and inside the city walls, a quarter of a million people is a lot of people. So you can imagine what Jesus did when he went and found this person. For me or you, we'd be looking for the guy with the beard and the sandals, right? Which would be pretty much impossible. But Jesus supernaturally finds this guy and he heals him again. And this time he gives him spiritual sight. And he does it by revealing himself as the son of God, as the light of the world. And this man, in his response, he does it by worshiping Jesus. This word worship actually means to prostrate, prostrate, prostrate yourself in homage. He fell down at the feet of Jesus. And like Pastor Ted shared last week, he made him Lord of his life, Lord of his life. And this is where we pick up our text this morning, beginning in John chapter 9, verse 39, and we're going to read through chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with Jesus heard these words and said to him, 
Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. And so what does Jesus do? He gives the interpretation of this illustration, and he says to them again, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now today we're just going to be looking at two quick points because there are so many benefits in this for you and I, but also for the non-believer. And that's the two points we're going to look at, the benefit of the door to the believer and the benefit of the door to the unbeliever. And I say this because Jesus' audience at this point is both unbelieving and believing. He had his disciples at his side, those who had been following him, the apostles, but he also had unbelievers who weren't sure still, not knowing exactly who, who this man Jesus was. But in the beginning here in this illustration, Jesus uses a metaphor based on first century Eastern sheep ranching. He uses the word sheepfold, which would be very relatable to this culture. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of a, a sheepfold, I think of this nice galvanized pipe corral, right? This nice sturdy columns and just like, you know, a swing gate maybe with a remote control on it, you know, little electrical wire around it, so just kind of give it a little zap to the sheep in case they get out of hand, right? Uh, but if you look at sheepfolds and what they were made of in biblical times, uh, they were made of sometimes of wood, which is basically wasn't uh, timbers, it was actually branches and, and just uh, whatever they could find just to make a, a makeshift corral. But for the most part, they were made out of rock. Uh, and Lord knows you've better been to Israel. They have plenty of rock to go, uh, to go everywhere. Now, as far as Jesus referring himself to the door, or some of your versions might say the gate, if you were look at, uh, to look at pictures of, of biblical times sheepfold, you'll see that they're just walls but no gate. And the reason that is is because the shepherd, he was the door. He was the gate, and this is what Jesus refers himself to as the door. I am the door. And the door of the shepherd, he was the gate. And the reason being, because him being there would protect his sheep. He would guide them and lead them into this fold, but also be there and watch over them, making sure that they didn't leave or wander off. And he, at night, he would lay there. He would sleep there. He would protect them from predators for those who may come against them or try to even steal them, like thieves and robbers, as mentioned here. Now, the benefit to the sheep of having a sheepfold it was a source of comfort. It was a source of security, a source of protection. It was being provided for. It was being cared for. And this is the same benefit for you and I today as believers in Christ. Those of you who have committed yourself to Jesus, you are a part of the sheepfold. But he gives you all these benefits today, right now, at this moment. You are protected. You are cared for. He does give you that confidence knowing who you are in Christ and knowing that you're going to have all the comfort that you need. Not when we die, but right now, in this moment, in this time, even in the times that we're going through right now. But I want you to keep in mind that the emphasis is not on the sheepfold. It's on the door, the shepherd. It's, it's his resource. He brings you into that sheepfold. But you have to go through this door. It's the shepherd who guides and leads, who watches over our souls, who watches over our lives, who watches over our every step and every move that we make. And if you haven't figured that out yet, this message is all about relationship. This passage of scripture is all about relationship. But notice what he says here in verses three and four again. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep, they hear his voice. And when he brings out his own sheep, in verse four, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, 
for they know his voice. When I left out one other part there in verse 3, he calls his own sheep by name. Now this illustration that we're looking at in the first five verses, sheep recognize their voice just, or recognize their shepherd just by the sound of a voice. Now I know sheep always get a bad rap, right? You probably heard plenty of sermons and different teachings on sheep and how God relates them to people because they're like the dumbest animal in the world, right? Well, you know, God doesn't do dumb and I don't think sheep are that stupid, okay? Because if you look at some of the instincts that uh, they have, First of all, in, that, in the time of this culture, they were considered to be very valuable, uh, just like you are today. And you also know that when sheep, when they are together, when they feel a threat, they'll actually band together as one. Have you ever seen videos on this? When they feel threatened, they actually go like cheek to cheek kind of, and they just kind of just look in all directions because they know that there's a threat coming. They also can mourn. They do mourn when they lose one of their sheep brothers or sisters or one of their family members. They will mourn for them. But what Jesus is talking about here, that they can discern well uh, the well-known voice versus the voice of a stranger, as it says here in verse 5. They know the difference between who their shepherd is and who a thief or a robber is, who the stranger is. And the reason why they can distinguish between the voice of a shepherd and the voice of a stranger, as it says here in verse 3, it says the shepherd, he calls them by name. He calls them by name. And that's so important. It's so important for us today because God calls you by name. Just like how many of you have kids? Just one of you? Okay. No, I know there's more of you. Yeah. You name your kids, right? You know them by name, unless you number them. How many of you number your kids? Boy one, boy two, okay? You go, boy two, you go, yeah. If you have kids in the double digit figures, then yeah, I could see you numbering, but we call them by name, right? We give them individual names. God knows your name. Individually, he knows who you are. He knows exactly who you are. And you know, when you look at this uh, relationship to sheep and how a shepherd does this, the reason why he does this is gives them name because he's be able to relate to them and them to him. He knows their individual needs. He knows if uh, sheep Jim over there needs this or sheep Bill over there needs that. He knows exactly what they need. This was their culture. This is what they did back in their culture. They would give them names and they still do to this day. And the reason why these sheep can distinguish the voice of the shepherd is because of that reason. He calls them by name. He knows every one of them. He gets well acquainted with their sheep. That's what a shepherd does. He's very well acquainted with his sheep. That's what our shepherd does. He's very well acquainted with you, believe it or not. He's not a God who's too big and too far away. He's a God of detail. He's a God who's precise. He's a God who's intimate with his flock. You know, a great example of this is Moses and the Lord and their relationship. There's a passage of scripture that says that God talked to Moses as he talked to a friend. And in Exodus chapter 33, the Lord had, or God, or Moses had asked God for some help. And he said, I'm gonna send you my presence. And he says this in verse 17, he says, so the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken. For you have found grace in my sight and I know you by name meaning I know you personally. I know who you are. I know your motives. I know your heart. I know exactly everything about you. You know, if you look at Psalm 139, I think David was a man before his time. He knew this. He knew how intimate God was. He knew that God knew him by name. Psalm 139 mentions that, how you know, everything I do, God, you're there. My rising up, my sitting down, you know everything I'm going to say before I even say it. Everything. You know everything about me. Sheep become well acquainted with their shepherd and know the shepherd is speaking to them. And let me ask you this question. Those of you who are sheep, sheep of God, are you well acquainted with your shepherd? Do you recognize his voice when he's speaking to you? You know, as a pastor, and I'm sure all the pastors can testify to this, is that one of the statements that we always hear is that, I don't know if God's speaking to me or speaks to me because I don't hear him. Or a question is, might be like, you know, how do I know that God is speaking to me? How do I know it's not my, just my feelings or my emotions or just my own thoughts? You know, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Ted gave you that answer. And I love the way he put it. He brought to attention the actions of Mary Magdalene every step of the way before Christ's death, after his resurrection. And do you remember how 
She recognized Jesus after the resurrection. It wasn't by sight, right? She thought he was the gardener. How she recognized him was by his voice when he said, Mary. He called her by name, and she knew that that was her Lord, that was her Messiah, just by calling her by name. And when you really think about that, the only way that she could recognize his voice is by how? Spending time with him, right? She knew. She had spent time with him every step of the way. She was overwhelmed, I'm sure, because of what he did for her. Uh, he set her free from her demonic uh, depression and oppression. He set her free from many things. And I'm sure she was so grateful, always at his feet, serving him throughout this time when he was on, on this earth in ministry. She got to know him intimately, and he knew her very well. But she would never have recognized his voice unless she had spent time with him. She had spent time with him. Let me ask this, this question to you. Is how much time are you spending with your king, with your shepherd? Because that's the way you're going to get to know him. That's how you're going to hear from him. It's you taking the time, sitting at his feet, and just being still and being quiet. And I know that's hard for a lot of us to do because we have this agenda and we have to you know, keep moving. We have to keep going. We have to do this. We have to do that. And we do. We have a lot of responsibilities, but yet there has to be a time just, just for you and God, just to be able to sit at his feet individually, just you and him. Listen, if you think that you're not hearing from God, then you need to ask yourself that question. How much time am I spending with him? How much time am I sitting at his feet and really paying attention to what he's saying to me? Because he's speaking. He's always speaking. I know for me personally, if I don't hear from God, I know what, he's, I know what I'm doing and I know what I'm not doing. I'm too busy trying to fulfill my own agenda. There's one thing that I've learned in ministry and I know Pastor Ted and all the pastors can testify to the same thing, is that man, don't hold too tight to your agenda because you know, God's gonna make you flexible and he's gonna change your direction a lot of times. But for me, I have to be still and that's hard for me to do, but I have to force myself and discipline myself to sit at his feet and hear he, what he's saying to me because he is speaking. But again, are you listening? Are you hearing his voice? Now, I don't know about you, but I find great comfort and security knowing that I have this shepherd that's watching over my soul, that he's watching my every step, every move, understanding where I'm at, and willing to put me back on the right path. I love that last song we just did, that refiner. I mean, did you hear the words to that? Those are hard words to sing because you're inviting God to have his way with you. How many times do we do that and pray that? Lord, just have your way with me, whatever you want. I'll do whatever you want. I'll remove anything you want. Just tell me what to do. It's a hard thing to commit to, but yet it's not impossible. But it takes time. We have to sit at his feet. But I also gain, gain great confidence knowing that he is right here in my midst and that he knows everything about me. And I don't have to walk in fear. Look again at verses three and four. And I love this part. It says, to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And in verse four, he says, he brings out his own sheep and he goes before them. He goes before them. And I love that. You know, if you were to look at Western sheep ranchers versus Eastern, there's a big difference. Our culture, our Western side, we drive sheep. They use horses and dogs and they drive them and move them to their destiny. Eastern shepherds don't do that. They always lead. They're always in the front. They're leading their flock. And I watched this video once on an Eastern shepherd who was taking his flock through a busy city. I mean, I'm talking about traffic and cars and traffic signals. And he led them all the way. And when he stopped, they stopped. And he would make these noises and call them by name. And he would say, let's go. And they would go crossing busy streets, never looking back, just moving forward. The sheep just heard his voice and they would just follow his lead. That's the beauty about being led. He goes before us. And I know, you know, right now we say that we're living in uncertain times, right? I mean, especially the last couple of years, I'm sure that we've 
all see, seeing things that we haven't seen before and it's still not over. But these times aren't uncertain to him. He knows. He knew this was gonna happen. Now some of us are probably being challenged and you know, we're probably being stretched a little and maybe some of us are just now waking up. But I believe you know, when we are being led by the shepherd, he goes before us, he knows. He leads his flock and what Jesus is saying here by leading his flock, it means that he never leaves them unattended. A shepherd never leaves his flock unattended. He is always by their side. And if he's not there, then he gets an under-shepherd who takes care of them until he returns. He spends time with his flock. Him going before them means that he's seeking out the best thing for their lives, the best pastures, the best watering holes, everything that they need. And the same thing for you and I today. He goes before you and he leads you. He knows what's best for you. And he's going to bring you to that place until we see him face to face. But we have to trust in him. And I know, I, I love what Moses told Joshua in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8. He says, And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. I love that. He's always there. He's always going before us. He's even gone before us in death. If you look at Psalm 23, David again, a man before his time, knew that when he wrote that psalm. He knew that God went before him. He provided everything he needed. He even was going to go before him in death. And he does the same for you and I today. Nothing's changed. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. But listen, we don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in fear at all. Remember, Jesus has gone before us, even in death. And I just want to say this to you. Don't let fear dictate your life. Don't let the fear of this world dictate your life or make your decisions. Fear God. That's all we need to do is fear God. Keep your eyes on the rock. You know, later on in this chapter, Jesus says some amazing things. In John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone, that means no one, will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me, he's greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. That's a double life insurance policy that you can't buy. That's amazing. We are protected. We are provided for. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He'll always be with us, no matter what. And again, the emphasis is not on the sheepfold, but it's on the door, the door of the sheep. Jesus Christ, the shepherd, who is our shepherd, is the source of our comfort. He's the source of our security, our protection, and even our provisions, as it talks about here in this passage. He knows you by name. He's the one who is leading you. He's the one who goes before you. He is and should be your confidence. He knows you intimately, and he wants you to know him intimately. And again, my question to you is, how much time are you spending with him? Because that's the key. How much time we spend with him. You want to hear his voice? Then you need to take the time to spend time with him. Well, the other benefit uh, to the door is to the non-believer. By Jesus referring to himself as I am the door was not only pro to proclaim his deity, but that he was the true shepherd, but also to the unbeliever to know, which would include the Pharisees that we've been talking about a little bit, uh, he was the only way into that sheepfold. He was the only way to the Father. And the reason why I included, included chapter 9 in our reading this morning was to show how Jesus uses this miracle of healing as a platform to minister to these Pharisees and to the unbelievers in the crowd here. In verse 39, in chapter 9, if you notice, again, it says that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. I know it sounds kind of confusing. I think it was even to the Pharisees, but you have to give them a little credit here because they knew that Jesus was talking about them because it says in verse 40 of chapter 9 that they asked this question to Jesus, are we blind also? You know, I love that answer because that means there was some conviction there. 
they heard that and they were convicted, even though they didn't ask the right question, but yet they still were convicted. And I, I always believe that if there's conviction, there's hope. Some of you who have kids maybe who have wandered off and maybe they're kind of running amok, prodigal kids. If you see conviction in, in them, that's your hope. If you talk with them and they are convicted, that's a good thing. And I say conviction because later on in this chapter, after Jesus is done giving this little mini sermon, it says that the, the leaders were divided. There was division. And I love that. That's great. Division is good. That means there's conviction. But I want to get back to the Pharisees a little bit. Um, just to kind of get a clear picture of what Jesus is saying here. You know, the Pharisees were, became part of the spiritual leadership of Israel. You know, they were developed sometime in between that 400 years of silence in history. They started out with good intentions. Uh, they asserted that God should be worshipped uh, in everywhere besides the temple, besides outside of Jerusalem. They believed that worship not only consists of the blood sacrifices of the priests at the temple, but it should be in personal prayer and the study of God's law. So the Pharisees fostered in the synagogues, and synagogues were put into little towns and their people would be able to come and worship God there. And that's, that's a great idea. It's good. I mean, that's why we have churches. They're like synagogues. But obviously, the Pharisees got off track somewhere. They started ignoring the word of, and the work of God. And we saw that in chapter 9. They began ruling the people of Israel, the children of Israel, uh, with an iron fist. And we see that in chapter 9, when they excommunicated this man and dismissed his miracle. Um, the people walked in fear of them more than they did in the fear of God. And we also saw that in chapter 9 when the parents came to meet with the Pharisees. They said that they feared them. They were afraid to answer them because of what might happen to them. These false shepherds were fleecing the flock only for their own personal gain. They misused their privilege of being the shepherd for their king and they became completely self-absorbed. Now how did they get off track? How did, they, how did they come from leading the people to misusing them? Well, it's easy to do, right? They took their eyes off the Lord. Jesus, when he spoke to the uh, disciples and the multitudes in chapter 23 of Matthew, he said this in regards to the scribes and Pharisees. Uh, in Matthew 23, 4, he says, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. These guys got off track because they were rewriting the law. Remember when Jesus said, you've heard it said? Because they were listening to other people. The Pharisees were rewriting the laws. The leaders were rewriting the laws. They were taking quotes from other people, other Pharisees, and saying, this is what God is saying. But Jesus says, you have heard it said, but this is what I say. This is what it really means. And obviously these Pharisees got off track ignoring the work of God, ignoring his word, and Jesus said this about the Pharisees, and you're probably all familiar with Matthew 23. It's a really intense chapter if you ever get to read it. But in that chapter, there's a portion in there that's called the seven woes of the scribes and Pharisees, where Jesus says, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Uh, he says, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You devour widows' houses, and you're blind guides full of extortion and self-indulgence. You're like whitewashed tombs, you're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Outwardly, you look righteous, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Jesus even said to them, hey, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes, and some of them you're going to kill and crucify, and you're going to scourge in your synagogues, and you're going to persecute them from city to city. They were stealing, they were killing and destroying God's people because of envy, because of pride, because of arrogance, because they wanted what they wanted for themselves. They began to rule the people with force and cruelty, burdens that they could not lift themselves. They became the thieves and the robbers. In Matthew 23, Jesus says this also about them. He says, you're serpents. He calls them serpents, snakes. And he says this statement that is pretty powerful. He says, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Well, I know the answer to that. It's through the door. It's through the door. It's the only way. 
I don't know, I painted this ugly picture of the Pharisees and before we go off judging them and thinking how bad they are and how wicked they were, which they were, but you know, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, such were some of you or some of us. Um, there's a passage in Matthew 18, and I love this because a lot of people don't realize that this was not only meant for the common lost people of Israel, but this was meant for the leaders of Israel as well. Jesus said that the Son of Man has not come to save, or the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. They were lost. And again, I paint this picture for you because I want you to see the beauty of this passage of chapter 10. Because when you look at this, you think, well, okay, this is to the believers, man. You know, we get to be in the sheepfold of Jesus. You know, Jesus is saying, I'm the door. You, all you are welcome, those of you who believe in me. My sheep, you're welcome here. But you Pharisees, no, no, no. You're a bunch of hypocrites. You're a bunch of liars. You're not allowed. The door that Jesus refers himself to is a door of invitation. He was speaking to us as a church, to believers, to saying this, this is what the benefits that you have. These are the comforts that you have. I am your shepherd. I will protect you. I will guide you. I will lead you all the way to me until we see you face to face. But to the unbeliever, you're welcome to come in. It's for you. I am the door. I am the door who's going to provide for you. All you have to do is trust in me and believe in me, and I will take care of you, and I will lead you and guide you. Now, the Pharisees and the unbelievers, I know we look at the Pharisees and say, well, how could you know, Jesus spend so much time talking with them? That's why, because they were lost. He was inviting them in as well not just the common people, but the leaders of Israel as well, including the Pharisees. And I say that because this door of invitation is an invitation for everyone today as well. And I love this passage because it does speak, it's been spoken from generation to generation and still applies from generation to generation to even today. And as Jesus extended this invitation to those who were hearing him, I wanna extend that invitation to you this morning. But before we do that, I just want to leave you with a few questions here this morning. Reflection questions that maybe you can meditate on throughout your week and maybe something you can discuss around your Thanksgiving dinner table. Number one, do you recognize the voice of the chief shepherd? Or are you distracted with other voice, voices such as the world or even your own voice? Again, remember, Jesus is an intimate shepherd. He knows you intimately. He knows you by name, but he wants you to know him in the same way. And again, that's going to take a commitment for you to spend time with him, to sit at his feet and spend time with him. That's the second question. How much time are you spending at the feet of Jesus? And what changes can I make to spend more time with him? And the last question, are you allowing Jesus to lead your life or are you doing the leading? (laughs) 